We are in the midst of a sermon series in which we are looking at the life of Jesus through the Gospel of John, and particularly the seven I am statements about Jesus that are found in John's Gospel. Before I share where we are today, I'd like to just say something about why it's so significant that Jesus said these seven times, I am. You see, as he would have proclaimed that in the first century, anybody who would have heard him would have known that he was taking on God's sacred name, God's covenantal name for himself. You see, in the book of Exodus, in chapter 5, we find the time where Moses is leading the children of Israel, and he stands before a burning bush as God is preparing him to go and take his rightful place as the one who will address Pharaoh and finally lead the children of Israel out of bondage, out of slavery, to the promised land. And as Moses stands before this bush that's burning, and literally God is speaking to him in the text, Moses asks a question that's a pretty basic question. Who shall I say sent me? What's your name? In other words, he was asking. And the answer was, God responded with this statement. He says, I am. And then he said something that's hard to translate. He says, I am that I am. Now, with that statement, God speaks what we know in Hebrew is four consonants. Y-H-W-H. It is actually called the tetragrammaton. These four consonants that make up this sacred name of God. What's interesting is by the time that we receive the Hebrew text, it has been handed down to us by Masoretic scribes who interestingly, and children, if you're listening, I would like you to try this at home. I'm telling you to try this. They wrote their words without vowels. They omitted all the vowels. So what you get is Y-H-W-H is four consonants, is tetragrammaton, but we don't know what the vowels are in that name. Therefore, we have said, well, the name for God could be Yahweh. That's using two vowels. Or it could have three vowels, and possibly the name would be Jehovah. That's putting three vowels with those four consonants. Interestingly, however, in Judaism, they never tried to do that. They just kept it as four letters, or they would even sometimes in their text put four dashes because they felt the name of God was so sacred that his name should not even be spoken. So what we do, if you look in a Christian Bible and you look in the Old Testament, any time that this name appears, it will appear as four capital letters, L-O-R-D, the word Lord. Now, it can be a little confusing because there are other times that the word Lord appears in small letters. That is not the proper name for God. But when the four capital letters, L-O-R-D, are put out, that is the times in which the text uses this sacred name for God. To let you know how many times it appears in the Hebrew text, it appears 6,828 times in our Old Testament. So this name of God... Y-H-W-H, which also gets translated as I am. If you put it as two words, it's I am. In one word, it could be Yahweh, or it could be Jehovah. Now, I say that because we are exactly in the middle of the seven I am statements of Jesus. We are now at the fourth. We have so far heard Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door or the gate. We talked about that last week. This week, we come to the fourth, the middle of the seven statements where the statement is, I am the good shepherd. We will be looking at, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And finally, I am the vine. But this morning, we're looking at, I am the good shepherd. If you look in the Old Testament that I read this morning, the Psalms, you'll notice something interesting about shepherd and God. Shepherd and Yahweh. And again, if you look at your 23rd Psalm, you'll discover that it begins with those four capital letters. The Lord, God, is my shepherd. God literally declares in the 23rd Psalm 
to be the shepherd of all of us, all of his people. As you look at the end of the 23rd Psalm, it also says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord, L-O-R-D, again, four capital letters, proper name for God forever. It's our promise of being with God for all eternity. And so now we come to the time in which Jesus speaks about it and identifies himself as our shepherd. I remember in my first church one time I was preaching a sermon on Jesus being the good shepherd, and a woman came to me after worship, and she said, you know, I don't like this shepherd idea. And I thought that was rather interesting. I wasn't sure if she was disagreeing with me or disagreeing with the biblical text. And I said, well, why is that? And she said, because sheep are dumb. I don't like to think of myself as being stupid. And I've thought of that over the years, and I think I can't speak for you, but I am just sometimes a dumb sheep. That's just who I am. I mess up over and over and over and get things wrong again and again, and I am more than content with understanding that God knows and Jesus knows things a whole lot better than I do, and I will just make those same mistakes, and I do need the leading of a good shepherd, and that's who Jesus declares himself to be, the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd, he said. Now, it's interesting because we've already established that he's declaring himself to be Yahweh, Jehovah, God, with his statement, I am. He's now using, as we've seen in the 23rd Psalm, Jesus is declaring himself to really identify with his shepherd that, that we see in the 23rd Psalm. But did you notice also that he puts another word with it? He doesn't just say that he's a shepherd. He says he's a good shepherd. Good when we think of our relationship with Christ, let's never forget that. Jesus is not a bad shepherd. He's our good shepherd. In the book of Jeremiah, if you look at Jeremiah 23, Jeremiah warned the people of bad shepherds. He said, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. What he was describing, Describing as the last five kings of Israel who were really tyrannical leaders and led the children of Israel into great division, not ability to get along with each other. They led themselves to such a place that eventually the nation of Judah went into captivity under the Babylonians. And Jeremiah was warning about how important it is that if you're going to follow a shepherd, follow a good shepherd. It's a warning we often try to tell people. If you find a congregation and you have shepherds who, again, that shepherd is the word pastor, which we use for pastors of the church. Make sure your pastors care about you and love you. That's something I can guarantee you, not only with those who are active pastors at Faith Community Church, but those who are retired pastors in our congregation. They love this congregation and care about you deeply. And if you're looking for a congregation or a church, and you're at a place where you don't feel as if the pastors love and care about you and are good shepherds and have your best interest in mind and care about you, as that's why we're talking about how we open. We're not making some arbitrary decision that serves Pastor Stan or serves some leader. We're trying to be very sensitive and listen to our congregation because Jeremiah warns us of bad shepherds. That we have a responsibility in any time we have that kind of relationship where we take care or care for people. But the ultimate good shepherd is not a pastor. The ultimate good shepherd is Jesus. In the book of Philippians, one of my favorite Greek words is the word kenosis. It describes who Jesus is really as our shepherd. And the word kenosis means emptying. And it says Jesus literally emptied himself to become one of us. He made himself a servant. He literally gave up everything for us. And of course, in our text here, we're told, and I read, the good shepherd, verse 13, lays down his life for the sheep. John 10, 13. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He then goes on and describes one who's not a good shepherd. He said, he who is a hired hand is not a shepherd who does not own the sheep. He sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf snatches and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and he cares nothing for the sheep. 
You see, Jesus is describing why we should trust him. Because ultimately, when we look at the life of Christ and we read about him in the Gospels, whether it be Matthew, Mark, Luke, or in the Gospel of John, we continually see a person who loves and cares and guides and cares for the weakest and cares for the person who has the ultimate struggles and takes someone who's oppressed and puts himself in the place where he protects them and cares for them. And even at the point of where people turn against him, he doesn't lash back, but he loves to the very end and lays down his life for others. He emptied himself. He's not just some hireling who came in to do some work and didn't really care about people. He's not a person who shows up for work late and doesn't care about the company. He's a person who ultimately gives us the example of what it means to love. And he is our greatest example of love. And in our relationship with Jesus, which is what I'm inviting you this morning, is to really consider your relationship with the Good Shepherd. He's there to let you know he loves you and he cares for you no matter what you're going through. He's not being judging. He's not being condemning. He's encouraging and caring for you. Years ago, I was, I think, probably my first real job. I'd had a couple other jobs before that, but I was working for Wendy's in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And it got to the end of my shift, and all of a sudden, it got really busy, and I didn't know the guy who had came in was the regional manager. He saw my name tag, and he said, Stan, I need you on the grill. And I said, nope. I'm out of here, my time's over, and I threw my apron down, took my badge off, and checked out and left. I went back to work the next day, and I was told by the manager that I almost got fired for that decision. It wasn't a good decision, because the general manager, the regional manager, was there at Wendy's, and he simply wanted me to help for a few minutes, and he said, you really shouldn't have that kind of attitude when you come to work. He said, I had to argue just to keep you as an employee of the company. But you see, I had no vested interest in Wendy's. I was just there to get a paycheck and do my job and leave. And I realized that it was very different for me had that been a restaurant that I cared about or had I been invested in caring about my work. And I learned a lot from that experience. Jesus reminds us that he's not just Stan, a young 20-year-old working at Wendy's who just doesn't care, who's just there for a paycheck. He's rather the good shepherd who cares for us. And as we find ourselves this morning, we go through our prayer list, we go through the things that concern us. Let's never forget that the reason we gather together as Christians is because we honor the good shepherd and we seek to follow him because he cares about each one of us. And that's why the next thing that we read as we continue on in John chapter 10 is not only is Jesus a good shepherd, he knows. He knows something. He says he knows his sheep. Verse 14, he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for my sheep. Last week, we looked at how Jesus was the gatekeeper and literally the one who lays down to keep the sheep safe and secure and that it's an image of Jesus watching over us and caring for us no matter where we are. Here it goes a step beyond that and he says that Jesus knows each one of us personally and that's an amazing thought. That's one of the things that I don't know about you but I think about a lot of times. I think of all the people who have been in the entire world and the mystery of our faith is that we not only believe that there's a God, we not only believe that there's creation, but we believe as Christians in a very personal God who cares about us individually and personally. Jesus isn't just a good shepherd. He's a shepherd who knows his sheep. He knows them by name. You see, in the first century, there were not just small sheep pens. There were those where just one shepherd would lay down to protect his sheep. But there were also large sheep pens. And in those large sheep pens, there would be a whole bunch of sheep from, from different shepherds that would all come in in the evening, and there'd be a gatekeeper who, again, would lay down and keep them safe in the evening. But when the morning came and the shepherds would come along, the shepherds would come in one at a time and would call their own particular sheep. They didn't brand the sheep. The sheep literally learned their name. And they were sort of like animals or pets that we have today, where each sheep knew the shepherd's name, knew the shepherd, and would faithfully follow the sheep, the shepherd, out of the, out of the pen. There's even evidence in the first century that every single sheep was named by name. So the shepherd would come in the morning, and the first shepherd would show up. And if he had 40 sheep, he had to know each of their names and would call each one of them by name. And they would all come out, and they'd follow him out as they would go grazing for that day. 
a number of years ago, we got a new dog, and she was a little puppy, and we were having trouble with her. She her dog that we still own. Her name is Michelle. And we're having so much trouble training her that we finally decided to take her to a trainer. And the trainer was living over in Plimpton at the time, I think since she's moved to Florida. And when we got there, we noticed that every single time that the trainer would give a command to our dog, or she had other animals that were in there with other dogs that were there, her own personal dog would completely ignore her. And then if she wanted to speak to her dog, what she would do is she would speak to her dog in German. And I asked her one time, why do you do that? And she said, well, there are Doberman pinchers and there are German pinchers. And my dog is a German pincher, so I decided to make sure that my dog knew when I was speaking to him directly. And so I, the owner, speak to my dog directly in German and as long as I give a German command, none of the other dogs have any idea what I'm saying. Your dog doesn't know what I'm saying, but my dog knows my voice, knows my language, knows my personal language to my dog. She had an amazingly well-trained dog, and she also had a good knowledge of German that she had learned because of her pet. Makes me think kind of of the relationship God has with us. It's personal. He knows you by name. He knows your needs. He knows what you are. He knows your frustrations. He knows your hurts. He speaks your language. We talk about five love languages, the different languages in which we receive love. Jesus knows them in your life and knows how to relate to you personally. Build your relationship with the shepherd. Speak to him. Talk to him. Pray to him. Read his scriptures. Learn to make that relationship personal because that's what the Christian faith is about. It's not about institutions or denominations or rules or all the things that we get ourselves all caught up with and things that we can disagree with, how buildings should look, what music should sound like. All of that stuff is not important. What matters is our relationship with the Good Shepherd who knows you personally. That's what we're here for. That's why we have a worship service too honor and praise the one who loves you and me individually. Jesus is our good shepherd. He knows us. He knows his sheep. He knows his sheep by name. But the other thing that we discover out of our text is he's such a good shepherd, he pursues other sheep. He's not content for it just to be you and me. Jesus isn't making us some exclusive club that, wow, isn't it fun to be part of Faith Community Church and we have some secret that nobody else knows? Isn't it cool to be a Christian that we've got some inside group that we can keep to ourselves and we can feel better about ourselves? No, the shepherd who comes after us is the same shepherd who comes after everyone. John chapter 10, verse 16, he concludes his time of talking about being the good shepherd. And Jesus says, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold, and I must bring them also. And they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock with one shepherd. You see, the good shepherd does not have a static flock. The Christian church and the Christian faith is not something that the time is run out on and whoever is in is in and whoever hasn't heard a message isn't part of it. Jesus' desire is to pursue everyone and go after everyone to have a relationship. There's an old poem called The Hound of Heaven, which literally is the idea of the way that a hound goes after something. Jesus comes after us only in a loving, caring way. He pursues you. He pursues me. And in our life, if we look back over our life, we've messed up many times, every single one of us, but Jesus is always there lovingly, wooing, caring for, pursuing us, coming after us, and he does the same for others. We grow because our good shepherd is pursuing other sheep. You see, as he brings others into the fold and as we get to know other Christians who God is drawing and Jesus is working with, we discover what an awesome and wonderful, gracious God and, and what a loving Savior we serve as we see and hear the stories of others on how God's worked in their life. And so I ask you just to pause and think about all the ways in which Jesus has pursued you given you the right person at the right time when you're struggling to remind you that he's there, or maybe you were having a tough day and you decided to pick up a Bible and start reading it, and lo and behold, you just read the perfect passage of Scripture, or maybe a song came on the radio, and it reminded you when you're going through something tough that 
God cared about you and that Jesus was continually pursuing you, pursuing me just as he pursues others. A number of years ago, I had an iPod. I think those might not even be made anymore. I'm not really sure. But I had my iPod, and it was a couple cars ago. I had a way that I could plug it into the speaker, and then it would play over the speaker. But for some reason, every time I turned it on, it always turned on to the same thing. And it was a recording of a passion conference from Boston. And in that conference, the person who was speaking was reminding people, the way he began his, his talk, he reminded us of the global nature of the church and how the Christian church isn't really growing as much in America and Europe. In fact, it's not doing as well, but it's exploding in places like Latin America and Africa and in Asia. And he reminded us how God is pursuing people and that we can start thinking that somehow the faith is just for us or people who look like us or dress like us or act like us. But the truth is Jesus pursues sheep all over this world. And that's an amazing thought that the language that Jesus speaks to you and to me can be very different than what could be spoken today to somebody in Zimbabwe. But they are just as essential as an individual. In our own heritage as Christians, and especially as Methodists, we have a person who was the founder of our tradition. His name is John Wesley. And for us who are in this Methodist tradition, today is also another special day. It's not just Memorial Day. It's called Aldersgate Day. You see, on May 24th, 1738, John Wesley was a young Anglican minister in his early 30s. And I've been reading his journals recently, and especially over this young part of his life, and he describes how he grew up in a very legalistic relationship with God. He said he tried very hard not to do anything wrong and continued to put rules in his life to think that somehow if he did all these rules, that somehow he would be in and have favor with God. And he discovered that the more rules that he came up with, the more that he just found himself failing. And he got to know some people named the, called Moravians. And, and one time when he was coming to America to be a missionary, so here this guy is, is an ordained Anglican minister, and he's trying to legalistically live for God. He comes to America as a missionary to Savannah, Georgia, and on his way over, a horrible storm arises, and he's absolutely fearful for his life. And he realizes that he has no assurance of a relationship with God. It's all been about his own works and his own things. But during all that time, God continued and Jesus continued to pursue him and woo him and put people in his life to help him realize that he was loved and beloved and could just trust in Christ. And then in 1738, May 24th, in a place called Aldersgate in London, England, at a quarter to nine, John Wesley said he was in a meeting that he didn't even want to go to. He said that day there was a society meeting, and he didn't want to go, but he went reluctantly. And he said as he was there, a quarter to nine, they were reading from the preface of Martin Luther's introduction to the book of Romans, and somehow something happened. And at that moment, he realized that he didn't have to work to be a Christian. He didn't have to do anything. He just had to trust and believe. And he said his heart was strangely warmed, and he felt he did trust in Christ and Christ alone. And his life was literally changed when he realized it wasn't about him pursuing God. It wasn't about him pursuing the shepherd. The shepherd had always been pursuing him. All he had to do was accept. All he had to do was just trust and believe. He didn't have to do any more work. And it was a life-changing moment for John Wesley. We call this day Aldersgate Day, or this Sunday is Aldersgate Sunday, because it's a day to remember that the Good Shepherd knows each one of us. He knows his sheep. He pursues us, and he invites us just to trust him, just to follow, not to do anything. So this weekend, as we are celebrating Aldersgate Sunday and Memorial Day, I'm going to invite you to do the most difficult thing you can do, which is nothing. Don't do anything. Don't try to do anything to earn your favor with God or think that if I do one more thing that somehow God will be pleased. Rather, just trust. Just trust in the Good Shepherd. Just trust and believe that we get frustrated when 
we see people who do things differently than we think that we should do or act differently than we would like them to act. But none of that ultimately matters in our relationship with Christ. Jesus just invites us to follow him, to love him, to accept him. That's what this Sunday is about. Understanding and accepting the fact that we don't just serve any shepherd. We serve the good shepherd who loves us unconditionally. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us trust in you and help us trust in your Son, our Savior, Jesus, who is a good shepherd who gave his life for us and invites us to do nothing but to believe, to just understand that, that a dog owner can have an animal that they can speak to in another language so that that dog understands the owner's voice and words. And even more so, you want to speak to us. And just let us know you care for us. Help us bask in that love that you have for us and live out of the freedom that you give to us. For our Savior Jesus is our good shepherd. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.